Well, greetings, everyone. This is Amal Matu from University of Maryland. And uh, I realize I'm looking a little bit sh disheveled. Now, bear in mind that normally on video, video apparently adds like five pounds to your face. And it also makes you look a little bit less like Brad Pitt than I actually look. But nevertheless, uh, I, I am looking a little bit disheveled this morning, this Saturday morning. I worked late last night and got to bed maybe around three in the morning or so. It's kind of a rough shift. And one of the latter patients in that shift was a chest pain patient. Now, normally I love chest pain. I love doing a good history and uh, getting that EKG. And, and usually it's a, a fairly straightforward workup. But this patient in particular was kind of tough. It was a low risk type of chest pain patient, not so much from the ACS standpoint, but more from the pulmonary embolism standpoint. And the quandary that we had was, do we even start the workup in the first place. Now we know about PERC and D-dimers and Wells and Revised Geneva and all these different scoring systems, but you know, those are a little bit easier sometimes than simply trying to figure out, do I start the workup at all or do I just call it quits and don't do the workup even from the start? And that uh, could sometimes be a really tough question. Well, we did the workup, it turned, fortunately, and it turned out the patient did have a pulmonary embolism, a small one, and then the question came up, can we discharge this patient? This is one of the rare patients in inner city Baltimore who had pretty good follow-up. There's been some recent articles that talked about outpatient evaluation, and outpatient treatment for pulmonary embolism. We'll do that occasionally for DVT, but what about for PE? Is that safe? Can we rely on that literature? I don't know. We had a tough time with that. And so personally, whenever I have questions in my mind about how to manage or work up pulmonary embolism, there's two people both happen to be named Jeff that I turn to. One of them is named Jeff Klein. He's kind of the god of PE research. He's down in North Carolina, and so I can quickly look up some of his articles. He's got articles on just about every topic in PE. And the other Jeff is out on the West Coast, Jeff Tabus, who's at UCSF. He is the education god of pulmonary embolism, in my mind, and he's put out some really great and very practical lectures, and I love practicality. And so I went to CME Download and pulled up a recent lecture from Jeff on pulmonary embolism. Now this was taped at a UCSF conference called Topics in Emergency Medicine from November 2011, so just several months ago. And I believe they have that conference every fall. You can check it out or take a look at some of the lectures on CME Download. I'm going to show you a clip from that lecture that relates to these couple of questions that I had, and it helped me solve the queries and quandaries that I had during that shift. And had it not been for finding that information on see me download from Jeff, I think I would have been up till 4 or 5 in the morning and looking even worse than I do right now. So anyway, let's go to Jeff. We're going to talk about uh, avoiding pitfalls in PE. Now, I have to apologize because when Chris first asked me to give this talk, I thought it was a totally different topic. I thought it was avoiding the pitfalls of PE. That's a censored talk. I can't give that um, while we're being taped. But uh, yeah, that was my joke. My kids think I'm funny. Um, all right, so three quick things. Number one, Jeff Tabas is a really, really great guy, and really smart. Number two, his kids actually do think that he's really funny. And number three, he's not giving up his day job to become a comedian. We'll start out with a case. So, for some reason, I review several cases that are pretty similar to this. Most of, many of the missed PE cases are kind of like this. 38-year-old um, female, sudden onset, burning substernal chest pain for three hours. Not pleuritic, not positional, not radiating. No shortness of breath, no medications, not a smoker, no past medical history. So just burning substernal chest pain. The vitals are normal, the exam is normal, the ECG is normal, and the chest x-ray is clear. Who would evaluate this patient for PE? Show of hands. What are the pearls about risk factors? So risk factors increase your suspicion. If someone's had a, a clot in the past, then they're obviously at higher risk. But at least 20% of patients with PE have no known risk factors. We Okay, so that's a really, really important point to just stop for a second and say it again. At least 20% of patients 
with a proven PE do not have a risk factor at the time that they arrived. We all know about Verkau's triad, but that risk factor which caused the PE is oftentimes not discovered until after they're admitted and get the whole workup. So when they first arrived in the emergency department, a lot of them don't have any known risk factors. Please keep that in mind. We all know, you know, you could have factor V Leiden and not know it when you present to the ED. So lack of risk factors doesn't exclude PE. So lack of risk factors, maybe not that helpful. Presence of risk factors increases your suspicion. All right, signs and symptoms. Who here has learned about the signs and symptoms of PE? Everyone? So you guys all know that 73% of patients with PE have dyspnea, 66 have pleuritic chest pain, 37% have cough, 28% have leg swelling, 26% have chest, leg pain. This is very, very, very important. Except when they look at the patients who rule out for PE, it's all about the same frequency. So this is really confusing, right? 30% of patients with PE have tachycardia, but 23% of patients who get ruled out for PE also have tachycardia. Some patients with PE have an increased respiratory rate, but a lot of patients who rule out have an increased respiratory rate. How can all this be? Well, the reason is because patients who have conditions that mimic PE get evaluated for PE. So I can't really tell the difference between COPD and PE. They're the same symptoms. So how do signs and symptoms help us? If you go back and look at the original data, 97% of patients who, who had PE, who ruled in for PE, had one of the three following um, uh, signs or symptoms. They either had dyspnea, tachypnea, or pleuritic chest pain. Okay? So they either were short of breath, breathing fast, or the chest pain was pleuritic. Now, a lot of times this doesn't help you because those are the patients you're going to think about it in, but sometimes it does. That's kind of a starting base. Now, this hasn't been validated prospectively. I've been trying to get this validated for years out of various databases and have been unable. But at least for now, from what I can tell, the majority, if not all, of patients have at least one of these complaints or findings for PE. Okay, so what are the pearls from signs and symptoms? Because we all know patients with PE have pleuritic chest pain, shortness of breath. Probably the trigger to start the workup is either shortness of breath, increased respiratory rate, or pleuritic chest pain. I really love that. It's very simple and straightforward. So, shortness of breath, tachypnea, which Jeff is defining as a respiratory rate of 20 or above, or pleuritic chest pain. Remember, not just chest pain, it's got to be pleuritic chest pain. If they don't have pleuritic chest pain, tachypnea, or shortness of breath, no need to do the workup according to those numbers, and that's 97% accurate. Again, it hasn't been repeatedly validated, but it's very reasonable, and I think it's a sensible way of approaching the decision about whether you need to start the workup or not. That's what Jeff does, and that's what I've learned to do as well. Other thing, pitfalls on the history and physical, O2 sat and respiratory rate, just measure them. Just make sure you check them. Has anyone seen a patient who's actually breathing pretty quickly, whose respiratory rate's written as 18. Yeah, so of all the vital signs, I think the respiratory rate is the one that is mismeasured the most, and I think it's because you don't get it off a monitor, like the pulse you get off a monitor, the blood pressure you get off a monitor, the O2 sat you get off a monitor, but the respiratory rate we have to do ourselves. And so when do we even begin the workup? Okay, so we start the workup when there's one of three findings, dyspnea, tachypnea, and pleuritic chest pain, and no definitive alternate diagnosis. So let's just go back to that case one again. 38-year-old with sudden onset burning chest pain. Not pleuritic. No dyspnea. And no tachypnea, assuming you measured it yourself. This patient, I did not work up, and I personally don't believe they should be worked up for pulmonary embolism. Now, they did have a risk factor. This is a lecture on PE. So we'll give her that. But this patient didn't have PE, and I don't think that they necessarily should be worked up for PE. So once you've decided to start the workup, the next big question you need to ask yourself is, what's the pretest probability 
that this patient has a PE? Is it low, moderate, or high risk? There's some scoring systems out there that can help, but you know what? It turns out that a lot of people are recommending that you just use Gestalt rather than a formal scoring system. Let's hear what Jeff has to say about that decision. Gestalt versus a formal scoring system. Hopefully I've helped you decide when to start the workup, but how about assigning a risk category, low, moderate, or high? Who here uses Gestalt to decide, their just impression to decide low, moderate, or high risk? Who here uses a formal decision rule, like the Wells criteria? Wow, so it's about half and half. So about half of us use a decision rule, half of us use our own Gestalt. So let's just look at it. Okay, I'm going to tell you, this is all messed up. I hate to tell you, it's, I'm serious, it's all messed up. And we'll, we'll start with why, okay? So low, moderate, or high probability. So your patient has a 15% chance of having a PE. Who would call that low risk? Who would call that moderate risk? Who would call that high risk? Okay. So about two-thirds said moderate risk, one-third said high risk. This is what's whacked. The, the researchers define that as low risk. 15% is low risk. That's crazy, right? Now, I will bet you if we take everyone and ask everyone what your perception of low risk is, your number is different than your neighbor's number. Okay? It, low is not helpful. Whereas if you guys say, oh, I think this patient has a 5 to 10% risk, I bet you'll all be much, much, much closer. But if you call 15% low, I bet half of us call 15% high. So it really is crazy. I don't think we should ever use these terms. I don't think we should use low, moderate, or high risk for uh, MI or unstable angina. I don't think we should use it for PE. I think Personally, we should use a range. At least me, that's how I think. Now, other people might think differently. If you look, would you guys say 10% is moderate risk? Who thinks 10% is moderate risk? Pretty good guess? Okay. When Jeff Klein looked at what people called low, moderate, and high risk in that 8,000 patient ED study, it was basically what you're saying. So those patients who they called low risk had a 3% risk of PE. When they called them moderate risk, they had a 10% risk. High risk was 30%. So one out of three. If you think there's a one out of three chance your patient has a PE, many of us will call that high risk. So I think those terms, at least you're practicing differently than the literature. Has anyone learned that you can't send a D-dimer on a moderate risk patient? Anyone learned that? Because we learned that. You can't send a D-dimer on a moderate risk. That's because in the literature, moderate risk is 15 to 40 percent. For you, your moderate risk, you can send a D-dimer on because that's 10 percent, or my moderate risk is 10 percent. Well, that's a great point also. We've all learned that you should only use the Wells criteria and other things like that when your pretest probability is low. But what Jeff is saying is that when you actually look at what low, moderate, and high probability are in the original studies in which Wells was derived, well, what we consider to be moderate is actually considered low according to the Wells data. So in other words, translated, what that means is that we could probably start using D-dimers not just in patients that we consider low probability clinically by Gestalt, but we can use D-dimers in patients that we consider even moderate probability. And interestingly, in Europe, a lot of them are already doing that. And in some of the guidelines, the European guidelines, they already recommend using D-dimers in patients where you think it's moderate probability. You can go ahead and use a D-dimer. I'm going to start doing that now. Okay, we're going to skip over a big section of Jeff's lecture to get towards the end since I don't want this to run on too long. But just to recap what Jeff's talked about in terms of his workup, if you want to listen to the whole lecture, you can get at this. Uh, the first point that he makes is that when do you decide that you need to start the workup for PE? Well, if a patient has pleuritic chest pain or shortness of breath or tachypnea, then you start a workup. If they don't have any of those three, he doesn't even start. So if you have one of those three, you start the workup. The next thing Jeff recommends doing 
do the perk rule. All right, P-E-R-C, the perk rule. If somebody perks negative, he's done. If somebody perks positive, then he goes on and gets a D-dimer. If the D-dimer is negative and his clinical suspicion was low or moderate, he's done. If the D-dimer is positive, then he goes on to get the CAT scan. So it's a very, very nice stepwise approach. You can take a listen to the full lecture to hear his reasoning behind it. Again, I, I like it. it's very simple, practical, very nice, and stepwise. The next question that I had that I talked about at the very beginning was, what's all this discussion of outpatient management? Should we be sending any of these PE patients home for outpatient management of pulmonary embolism? Let's hear what Jeff has to say about that. Who here is treating patients entirely outpatient? PE. Patient comes in, diagnosed with PE. Don't need to admit them, send them home, doc. Let me warn you, you're going to start to feel this pressure. This is around the corner. So, current chest guidelines, ACCP guidelines 2008, no randomized trials, but they said some observational studies said they did okay. European Society guidelines 2008, they didn't recommend outpatient treatment, but they said it's conceivable based on the data. Okay? I'm going to tell you, I think it's crazy. You admit them for 24 hours. The old studies where they looked at this showed that in the first 24 hours, the risk of recurrent PE was 25% if the uh, heparinization was non-therapeutic. So your first 24 hours is your highest risk of recurrence. If you get anticoagulated after that, very low risk of recurrence. This is why you're going to hear a lot about it. Lancet 2001. Anybody hear about this article? They did a randomized control trial, 344 low-risk PE patients. They treated them with anoxaparin BID, and they either admitted them or sent them home to get their anox at home with Coumadin. And you know what? They did absolutely fine. So they took low-risk patients, they started them on Coumadin, started them on Lovenox, sent them home, and they were fine. So you are going to start getting pressure to send your patients home on Lovenox and Coumadin. And I'm just going to tell you why you shouldn't listen to them. Okay? This study took 19 emergency departments and three years to collect 344 patients. Okay? 19 emergency departments over th and three years to collect. You cannot find a patient that meets these criteria. So these are not just low risk. You're going to be told these are just low risk patients. These are PC class 1 and 2. These aren't just low risk patients. They excluded any patient with hypoxia, any patient with low blood pressure. Okay, I'd be willing to do that. Any patient who required IV pain medication. No, that's like all of them. Obesity, no, that's all of them. Unreliable, that means drinking alcohol. All of them, homeless, that's all of our patients. Definition of an alcoholic, the patient drinks more than their doctor. I'm telling you, you know, it's like, so you're not going to find a patient that meets these criteria. So I am just going to tell you, you are going to start to feel pressure, whether it's an organized system or your hospitalist or something to send these patients home. It turns out their average stay, even when they went home, they stayed in the ED for 12 hours. That was their average. I think what this study showed was that a short stay, 23-hour OBS unit, is perfect for these patients. I don't think it showed that sending them home because, you know, this is not going to be 12-hour stay. This is going to be give them the NOx, give them the Coumadin, send them home now, and none of those patients are going to meet these study criteria. All right, so bottom line for outpatient treatment appears to be no. Maybe observation unit for 23 hours, 24 hours, but outpatient management, there's too many exclusion criteria. If you start getting pressure to send these patients home, show the people that are pressuring you the exclusion criteria and chances are your patient doesn't qualify based on that study. So be very careful about that outpatient management. There's no good studies that support most of those patients going home. All right, that's it. Thank you very much to Dr. Jeff Tabus for clarifying some points on pulmonary embolism workup and also the outpatient management issue. Thank you very much. Until next time, this is Amal Matu signing off. Thanks.